world has been crying out for hope, for a hero to save us. We long for the supernatural, but there is only one God who can save the day. So clear the stage, prepare the way, 'cause heaven and earth are singing. Glory, hallelujah! Let the whole world see. Good morning, DWCC. How are you guys doing this morning? Would you stand with us wherever you are? Would you worship?
hearts, come on. You reign in our hearts. You reign above all. Be lifted on high. Come on, wherever you are, lift your hands and sing. Come on. You reign in our hearts. You reign above all. Be lifted on high. church. We are going to be so happy when we see you in person, but until that time, we thank you for being here. And to let us know you're here, comment on the comment sections on Facebook Live. Contact us at info at dwcc.org um, to let us know that you're here, or you can check in on our online connection card. That's also a wonderful way to say hello. We appreciate it. And um, on the online um, Facebook, if you could put in a comment about what you're thanking God for today. We know there's lots of things to gripe about, but we want to lift the name of our Lord on high. So please uh, take a look at that, um, your life, and think about how is God blessing you and share that with us today. We'd appreciate it. Second week of good news club is done and seven new kids came very exciting so we want to encourage you if your kids want to join in we are ready we are excited for them to come to day camp and it's on fridays talk to miss melody email us at kids at um, dwcc av.org. I can get it all out. I know I can. Um, and let us know that you would like to join in. There is a permission slip that needs to be filled out, but other than that, you're good to go. So the kids are having a great time and they're learning about Jesus. I mean, what more could we ask for? It's exciting. Um, Tuesday, we have a special worship in the courtyard starting at 630. I say it's special because this is the birthday edition. I am not saying whose birthday it is, but you'll find out when you come. So please come and help us celebrate someone special's birthday on that day. My son? No, <laughs> it is my son's birthday, but I know this other person's birthday too. So um, please come. There are cool breezes. There is social distancing. And there is beautiful worship music that will lift your hearts and minds. And then Pastor Joel has a message a word from the word that is encouraging for your week it's going to lift you up church i promise especially if you haven't been at anything else this is going to encourage your heart and to add to that prayer prayer in the courtyard is going to be on october 18th at six o'clock this is a great opportunity you don't have to say a word you can pray quietly but it is so encouraging to be with other believers and to speak to our father in heaven so i encourage you to come let me say a word, a prayer, and then we will continue with our service. Lord Jesus, we just thank you for this opportunity that we have to meet with you today. We thank you for all of those that are meeting with us all over the United States, all over the world, Lord God. 
what a blessing that this online church has been. We just pray that you would encourage hearts and lift minds, Lord Jesus, up to you, and that we would all leave here today ready to share your word. We thank you for how you will work in and through us. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with us as we worship?
sing.
is to be praised. The Lord is high above all nations and his glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God, who is seated on high, who looks far down on the heavens and the earth? He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes, with the princes of his people. He gives the barren woman a home, making her a joyous mother of children. Praise the Lord. Come on, wherever you are, sing this out. Let's all say, amen, amen.
Good morning, kids. Hey, you may have noticed I brought an umbrella with me today. And I brought it because I heard it's going to rain today. Ooh. Not here, but in your Bible adventure, it's going to rain. And also, the colors on my umbrella remind me of a rainbow. And you're going to talk today about why God sent the rainbow and what it really means. So if you'll bow your head and close your eyes, I'm going to pray for you. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for the rain. Thank you for your promises. Thank you for our church. We pray for our mommies and daddies, our grandmas and grandpas, our brothers and sisters, our teachers, and Pastor Joel. Amen. All right. All right. Melody, thank you so much. And uh, kids, I miss you guys. I just, uh, you know, I, I don't know if you listen to me or, or whatever, but uh, uh, it is not the same uh, to not be hearing your voices in the courtyard and wondering who's going to get a head injury. And I mean, I just, I miss that. I mean, you know, it's just, uh, you guys are amazing and uh, we're, we're getting there and, and that day will come. Um, I do, before I get into the message, want to speak to you, uh, just give you some information uh, as we get closer to election day here in our country. Um, I posted this on Facebook, but I think I'm going to say it because this is important stuff. I want to equip you with the information you need to know how to vote. And I hope you all will participate. And I know what I love about our church, we have a, a diversity of politics in our church. I love that. I think it makes us a stronger place. And, and, and I want to make sure all of you have the, the knowledge you need to know how to vote. So you probably got in the mail your ballot. You should have that by now. If you don't have that, make sure you talk to the L.A. County uh, registrar recorder. There's a website, lavote.net, that you can go to uh, for any of that information. So you probably have your ballots. You may have ballots of people who lived there before you. I don't know what you got, but you have your ballots, okay? You have three options. You can vote that thing right now and drop it in the mail. That's option one. Uh, you can vote that thing right now and find a drop-off location. Uh, the designated drop-off locations, you can find those on lavote.net, so just bring those over there. Or if, like me, you're old school and you just want to vote in person, you have the right to do that. Um, so I'm going to help you know how to do that well. Keep your ballot. Starting October 24th, there are some limited voting locations here in the Antelope Valley that will open up. Again, lavote.net. You should have gotten something in the mail that shows all the vote center locations. The ones with the asterisk open October 24th. The ones without open October 31st, I believe, okay? So take your ballot. This is important. Don't just go to the voting center and say, I want to vote in person. Take that ballot that you were going to mail in with you to the polling place, check in. Now, in L.A. County, you can go to any polling place. They don't have precincts like they used to. So you can go to Lancaster, you can go to L.A., you can go to Lakewood, you can go to Lawndale, whatever you want to do, you can vote anywhere. Your ballot will come up when you are put into the system, okay? It's really, really awesome. So maybe you work down below, you want to vote down there, no problem. You'll be voting on all the stuff that affects you here in the Antelope Valley. Bring that ballot. If you don't bring that ballot, they will make you vote provisionally. And that is a whole nother thing. And, and it, it'll, they'll verify and all that stuff. But it's better not to do that. You'll turn in your ballot. They'll give you a new ballot. You'll go to one of the machines and you can, uh, you can vote in person and turn in your, your ballot and you're good to go. Um, so the last part on that is if you go to the poll Understand there probably will be lines, there probably will be delays, there probably will be people who are confused and frustrated. Don't, but don't build into the drama. Don't get upset, don't get nervous. Just be calm, be courteous, be thankful, and do all those things. The people who work at these polls, I used to be an inspector, uh, so I manage poll sites. Um, a lot of them are elderly or a lot of them are just looking for extra income. They want to volunteer their time and help their, their, their county out. So let's treat them the way we would want to be treated. So make sure that you do that. And people of God, be sure you vote. I don't want to hear any of you come to me and say, well, our country's a mess, so I just didn't want to get involved. Don't even waste your breath on that. Get involved, get informed, 
and vote. All right, so that's off my chest. Now I can move into what I'm actually paid to talk about. Uh, and that's, <laughs> uh, that, that is the life of David today. We're going to continue to go through this. And I have to start with this. I don't know how one possibly can learn the English language if they didn't grow up speaking it. I have so much respect for people who do because words have different meanings. Have you noticed that? It's crazy. So I'm going to teach you one today. Not teach you. I'm just going to show one to you. It's the word goat, G-O-A-T. Now, some of you who are in rural, th rural locations are like, well, I know what a goat is. Okay, not that kind of goat. But you know, it used to be that to be a goat was a bad thing. Like, I remember in a, a playoff game when a fan at a Cubs game reached over Steve Bartman and grabbed the foul ball. He was the goat, right? Everyone blamed him for screwing up everything that the Cubs had ever hoped or dreamed of doing, right? He was the goat. But now, did you know that being the goat is a good thing? It's great. In fact, goat stands for the words greatest of all time. And so now everyone wants to be the goat. And when I turn on the radio, I, you know, sports talk, I hear this discussion. Who's the greatest basketball player of all time? Who's the greatest football player of all time? You know, because kids don't want to grow up to be a special team or they want to be the next Tom Brady. You know, they, they don't grow up wanting to be the, the guy who comes off the bench. They want to be Michael Jordan or LeBron James. And, and so we all in those fields want to be the greatest, and, and what I want to put before you today is that we can think that way when it comes to the praise that we bring to God, that it should be the goal of every follower of Jesus to be the greatest worshiper of all time, that we would put that kind of thought, that kind of energy, that kind of investment into how we praise God is so powerful and important. And so this is what we look at today in the life of David, who other than Jesus was the worship goat. He was the greatest of all time. He was the one that wrote the Psalms, many of the Psalms, the one who played musical instruments, who had a heart after God's own heart and was known as someone who was always worshiping God. And so today, as we talk about worship, we're going to pick up his story after the ascension to the throne. So now David is finally king. So we've moved, we, we've skipped some stuff, okay? But if I didn't skip stuff, we'd be doing David until literally Jesus came back again. So uh, we're, we're skipping ahead a little bit. He's finally the king. And we pick up at this time in which one, he kind of picks up his first item of business. Like he, yeah, go defeat the Philistines. But now what is he going to do? What is his priority as king? And priority one was to return the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. It had been in the possession of the Philistines who had stolen it. And that was a great source of shame for the people of God because the Ark of the Covenant represented the presence of God and was in the hands of people who didn't respect it or revere it. In fact, if you go back into the story in 1 Sam or 2 Samuel, you'll see uh, the hesitation that David had in bringing it into Jerusalem because of what had happened on the Ark's journey over to the city. It was a holy thing. It was to be revered above anything else. And so what we're going to do is we're going to move into 1 Chronicles 16 because the story kind of runs parallel to 2 Samuel chapter 6 because in 1 Samuel or 1 Chronicles 16 David instructs the people on how to worship. So here it is. I mean this is like uh you know Tom Brady teaching you how to throw a football. I mean not from Thursday, but you know uh You've got all these different things, and now it's like, here's the greatest teaching us how to do the thing that we want to do so well. And so we're going to see what David says in First Chronicles 16, 7 through 36. Would you stand uh, while I read God's word? That day, David first committed to Asaph and his associates this psalm of thanks to the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord. Call on his name. 
Make known among the nations what he has done. Sing to him, sing praise to him. Tell of all his wonderful acts. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Look to the Lord in his strength. Seek his face always. Remember the wonders he has done, his miracles and the judgments he pronounced. O descendants of Israel, his servant. O sons of Jacob, his chosen ones. He is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. He remembers his covenant forever. The word he commanded for a thousand generations. The covenant he made with Abraham, the oath he swore to Isaac. He confirmed it to Jacob as a decree to Israel as an everlasting covenant. To you, I will give the land of Canaan as the portion you will inherit. When they were but a few in number, few indeed, and strangers in it, they wandered from nation to nation, from one kingdom to another. He allowed no man to oppress them for their sake. He rebuked kings. Do not touch my anointed ones. Do, not, do my prophets no harm. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all peoples. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the nations are idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and joy in his dwelling place. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of nations. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Tremble before him, all the earth. The world is firmly established. It cannot be moved. Let the heavens rejoice. Let the earth be glad. Let them say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Let the sea resound in all that is in it. Let the fields be jubilant and everything in them. Then the trees of the forest will sing. They will sing for joy before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Cry out, save us, O God, our Savior. Gather us and deliver us from the nations, that we may give thanks to your holy name, that we may glory in your praise. Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Then all the people said, Amen, and praise the Lord you may be seated. All right, so we're going to talk about worship, and the thing that I want to show you today is two different commanded ways that God shows us how we are to worship, and it's clear, and you've probably heard this before, we are to worship in spirit and truth. Spirit and truth. Now, each of us tends to lean in one direction or another. Some of us are all into the spirit and we struggle like to study and really be serious disciples. Others of us, we are all about studying and learning and growing, but when it comes to worshiping in spirit, we get a little bit nervous about that. But it is not an either or proposition. It is a both and command. We are not either to worship in spirit or in truth. We are to worship in spirit and truth because without spirit, you don't have truth. And without truth, you're not in the spirit. Pastor John Piper said this. He said that truth without emotion produces dead orthodoxy and a church full of artificial admirers. On the other hand, emotion without truth produces empty frenzy and cultivates shallow people who refuse the disciple of rigorous thought. And then he adds this. He says, but true worship comes from people who are deeply emotional and who love deep and sound doctrine. Strong affections for God rooted in truth are the bone and marrow of biblical worship. So let's start with the first one. We are to worship in spirit. And what that means is this. Worship is expressive. We have a term in American culture, I don't know if you remember it, it's been a while, it's the word presidential, that there's this set of norms for a president, you know, a certain way that a president should act. I don't know what the term actually means, 
But I do know this, that in this moment, David was not being very, well, we'll say king-like because he wasn't a president. He was a king. In fact, we learn that David was rejoicing greatly. He had sacrificed a bull and a fattened calf and then was wearing a linen ephod. And it says this in 2 Samuel 6. It says, David was dancing before the Lord with all his might. Brian, we should have done a poll on this to say how many of you want to see Pastor Joel right now dance with all his might? It would probably be 99% yes and my family no. That would be the, uh, the, the way that would come out. Well, it just so happens that when David did this, his wife was not impressed. And David didn't care. He was the one who, I mean, basically she chastised him and, and, and said, what are you doing, man? You're, you're a king. Kings don't act like that. And David reminded her, that he was the king because the Lord chose him. And he kind of threw a little passive aggressive dig back at his wife because his wife was Saul's daughter. And he said, remember, it was the Lord who chose me and not your father. So, ouch. And then he goes on and says, I will celebrate before the Lord. And not only that, but then he goes a step further and promises that he would become even more undignified than that to what he calls the humiliation in his own eyes. He says, listen, I will express to the Lord gratitude for what he has done for me, and I don't care what anybody thinks it looks like. David was not a king who worshiped. He was a worshiper who was made to be a king. The word that we use here that translates into praise is the word Halal, H-A-L-A-L. That's the transliteration from English. Quite literally, the word halal is interesting. It, it means to be loudly boastful, to be relentless in pointing attention to something, which makes me kind of do a double take in my own thoughts about what it means to praise. Like if, if I'm just using the word praise, I, I, I'll be honest, praise to me is not always like, I don't think about boasting loudly. A lot of times I just think about going to church or singing along or clapping my hands, hopefully in rhythm and and, and, and doing other things like that. And, and I bring up the translation because I think maybe some of you, along with me, have allowed the edge to be taken off of the word praise and need to recapture a biblical picture of what praise is. In fact, it's from the words halal and jah, which is short for Yahweh or God, that we get the word, drum roll please, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. It's a very specific word for a very specific reason. So it is both extremely expressive, but also extremely exclusive. It's a reminder that only God deserves that kind of loud boasting or pointing of attention towards that all in, I don't care what you think expression that sadly I have offered to other things, which rea in reality weakens my praise to God. Remember this, Yahweh is God's personal name that he revealed to his people and it was a very holy thing. It would not be even said. So when we use the word hallelujah, let's make sure we're not talking about the fact that the that the garbage man came after I put the cans out. You know, it's, it's got to be something that's related to an act of God, something that he has done that only he could do. To use it otherwise, really, is to take the Lord's name in vain by cheapening it. If a king who was due all respect to his people reserved his halal for Yah, then I should do the same. You see, for David, it is very clear that worship was not something he watched, attended, or was at. It was something he did. In fact, worship is a verb. 
Absolutely, worship is a verb. When, when we talk about, you know, when will, be, will, when will we be allowed to come back to worship? The answer is right now. Right now, we can worship because worship is not about sitting in a room. Worship is about expressing something back to God. And in today's text, you see all kinds of examples. You see how David commanded action in worship. And he, here's some examples. Give praise to the Lord. That is a commandment. Sing to him, right? Music, obviously a foundational expression of worship. He adds this. Tell of all his wonderful acts. I don't know about you, but to me, that sounds a lot like evangelism or sharing our faith. Evangelism is praise because people who are in awe of God will tell others about God. That is how we're wired. He goes on, he says, look to the Lord. What is that? That's prayer. Prayer is praise. He says, remember his wonders. We'll expand on that soon, but to learn about God is praise. Tremble before him because to fear God is to praise him. And there are other biblical expressions as well. David danced. He played instruments. Talks about giving of the tithe, of serving, of fasting, of lifting hands, of shouting, of bowing down, clapping, and many others. The only one I don't see on this list is doing nothing. Passive spectating is not praise because in worship we bring something we give of ourselves we offer and submit we surrender all that we are for all that he is for no other reason than that he is worth it whether we are gathered together or scattered throughout the world now, I know that this talk of expression and worship will hit all of us in different ways. Some of you have probably opened a second window on your phone and are ordering linen ephods and praise flags from Amazon right now. <laughs> Others of you are actually starting to wonder what it would be like to move your body inside of church. And most of us are somewhere in between. Remember this, we are uniquely who we are. We are not called to be like that person or the other person. We are called to become more like Christ. So the goal is not to express praise so that we impress others or show someone how spiritual we are or get attention. That's the opposite of worship. We are to be obedient. And I'm going to let the Holy Spirit reveal to you as I will to me what that looks like in that moment. And I just want to remind you, when we are gathered, whether it's on Tuesday night or when we're brought back together here or in the courtyard on Sunday mornings, we don't want to look sideways when we worship because we have no idea what God is doing in other people in those moments. None. You don't know what I'm bringing and I don't know what you're bringing. Sure, we've shared some things, but have we really shared the depths of it? We don't know what kind of freedom someone is experiencing in that moment or what sin might be confronted in that moment or what huge things are being surrendered at the altar in that moment. But be thankful. Be thankful because Jesus calls us to worship in spirit. But that's not all. God also requires us to worship in truth. Because God is truth. So not only is worship expressive, but also worship is educated. And that's the second point of the message. So to express, even with great passion, your affection for anything other than God is not worship. It is an idol. So let's say you put on the linen ephod. You, put, you, you, you have the praise flags. And, and, and there's good music playing and you're dancing around and swaying and all that stuff is happening. But God, as God has revealed himself to be, is not the object of your praise. You are not worshiping. You are committing idolatry. It has to be the way God has revealed himself. David might have become undignified in his praise, but he was never uninformed about who he was worshiping 
and why. I mean, if you go back and look at this text in 1 Chronicles, you see him basically giving an accounting of all that God had done for his people. So he was celebrating his faithfulness. David did not lay down his doctrine when he dropped a beat. There are all kinds of worship out there. I've experienced them all. I, I will never forget the first time I walked into a Pentecostal worship service. I did not know if I had been transported to another world or if I was about to be physically assaulted by somebody or, or what was going to happen. I walked in and I was immediately starting to walk like moonwalk right back out of there. And, you know, <clears throat> this was in Washington, D.C., and, uh, you know, they welcome you in. It ended up being a great time. It was fantastic. Some of you come from that background and you walk into a more reserved church and you're like, you know, should we like call a mortuary here? Should, should we like, do, do, do we need to like get some help? Do we need to turn the temperature down and wake people up? Like, you know, why aren't they? And the thing is, is that in, in, in the Pentecostal setting or the, the highly charismatic setting, they, they, they can be right on the money theologically. And in the other non-expressive, you can have people, you wouldn't see it in their eyes, but they love the Lord with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. It, it, it's not about the style as long as God is at the center of it and that we celebrate him as he's revealed himself to be. Because God did not leave us uninformed about who we are worshiping. His word is replete with evidence of why he should be worshiped and commands to worship him, both for the things he's done and just merely for who he is. And so as we look at David's prescription for worship, I want to just point you to two words that talk about truth, and I'll put them up on, on your screen. They are the words remember and ascribe. Remember and ascribe. So we're going to start with remember. I want you to think about the last time you took a major test. Like for me, it was trying to pass the eye exam at the DMV before I got glasses. So like, no joke, like leaned in. I was like, E1574MPF. And then she's like, okay, tell them. I'm like, EMP. She's like, with your eyes open. I'm like, sorry, I would memorize them. Um, you know, but you know that the test that you take is not going to be on everything you've read or heard, but you don't know what exactly is going to be on the test. So if you're a really serious student, you're going to try to study everything. And you know that when you actually walk in and take that test, that test was won or lost days and weeks before. I mean, yeah, sometimes, you know, things come to your mind. Sometimes you guess C and you're right. Sometimes you're... <laughs> Like, like I was good enough at, you know, I mean, remember, I was a political science major. This was not my first chosen field. So in an essay, I could write with a lot of words and make it sound like I knew what I was talking about and I had absolutely no clue what I was saying, okay? So maybe you get by that way. But you know that how you perform on the actual test, that's won or lost days and weeks before in your reading, your attendance in class, all those different kinds of things as well. And that's kind of how faith can work too. How we are handling life today, like a lot, a lot of us are like, you know, well, it's their fault, it's their fault. And I've done that. I did that this week, right? But how we handle life today really reveals how prepared we were for it. You're like, wow, I couldn't have prepared for a virus. It's not about a virus. It's about a crisis. And strong faith endures. And maybe... One of the gifts that we've gotten through this whole pandemic and through all this craziness is we have learned that our foundation and our faith and what we knew was not as strong as we thought it was. And maybe that is serving as a springboard for us in getting deeper into the word of God and making sure that we are in community with people that are, that are holding us accountable and doing the kinds of things that we need to do in order to grow in our faith. And so now is the time to prepare for what is coming. We see that in David's life. Because for David, all of the stuff that would test him, he prepared for in the fields and wilderness. Those places where he would approach God with lament or complaint. 
and then remember the attributes and promises of God and find relief. I mean, there are, there are a lot of psalms that work like that, where it starts out like DEFCON 1, right? Everything's falling apart, and then he lists his complaint, and at the end appeals to something he knows about God. Had his situation changed by the time he wrote the psalm? No. But his perspective had because he saw it through truth. And truth is what keeps us going through these times. You know, when we take the Lord's Supper, we are told that whenever we take the bread and cup, we do so how? In remembrance of Jesus, which is not just a past tense activity. That is a preparation for what is to come. So how do you remember something? Well, you remember through repetition which is really throughout Scripture, considering that these truths and traditions we have were largely passed on through oral traditions. I mean, that's kind of crazy when you stop and think about it. Here we have all the tech now that allows us to, you know, transcribe something onto a phone just by our voice and all that stuff, and we're forgetting these key things. But without all those advantages, they, they, they remembered them because they were life, and so they told the story to their children, to their children's children, and it was passed on from one generation to another. All of their celebrations, the celebrations of God's people, were what? They were remembrances of past events and promised faithfulness. So they would take a feast in remembrance of this victory, or um, you know, they would celebrate this day in, because of what God did here, and it reinforced all of those things. We worship as we remember. And so part of truth is to remember what is, what was, what will be, who God is, what he's done, and what he's going to do. The second word he gives us is the word ascribe. Now, ascribe is, well, let me just do the verse first. The verse says this, ascribe to the Lord, all you families of nations, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name and bring an offering and come before him. Ascribe is one of those Bible words, right? It sounds good, like when we're reading it, you know, ascribe. I just sound like I know so much when I say that word. But what does it actually mean? Well, it actually means to give right, or to credit. And a lot of people get confused by that because they're like, whoa, 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 how can I give to God something that he doesn't already have, right? How can I add to God? Well, the short answer is you don't, okay, and you can't. Let me explain how that works. So, well, think of it this way. Think about the first time you met your spouse, some of you are like going back a long ways right now. Some of you, some of you are like young and you're like, oh, I already know who that person is. And, you know, it's, it's it, okay. We'll talk later. All right. But when you first meet someone, what do you have? You have a first impression. First impressions are powerful. There's no doubt about that. And sometimes they're so bad that you never get a second one. I mean, that's just, you know, how that rolls. Uh, my wife and I still have an argument over our first date and the details of how that went. But fortunately, she was able to get past that first impression of me and, you know, yeah, all is good. But as you then get to know them, your opinion of that person does what? It changes. You get new information. Now, are they changing as a person too? Yeah, there's some of that that goes on for sure. Are you changing them? Not as much as you'd like to think you did, okay? Mo most people are pretty, like we, this is one big misconception in relationships. We always think, well, you know, if this changes, then it'll be perfect. It ain't changing. That is not going to change. You better just buckle down and love that thing the way it is or accept it or work around it or whatever or somehow come to a point where you don't need that to change in order for you to move forward if, that, if that's how you're going to go. But what happens is this. You get better information and then the gap closes. And here's the gap. The gap between who they are and who you understand them to be. So it closes, right? 
You're, you, you know, you, you didn't realize how compassionate they were until you went through a crisis and you had a breakdown and they came alongside of you. You're like, wow, I really saw that in action. And then you're getting closer, right? Your understanding of them is getting closer to who they actually are. Well, to ascribe to God his glory is to credit him for what he already is, which is to close the gap between where God is and who God is, and he doesn't change, he's the same, and our understanding of who he is. Every time we move closer to the reality, we are ascribing. We are giving credit where credit is due. And as we get closer, our worship grows. We become more passionate because we're more informed and we're like, he really is awesome. Like, you know, when, when we're new in Christianity, we're like, he's awesome because I like church. But then as we get into the word of God and, 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 and we start to experience transformation, we're like, he is awesome because he did in my life what nobody else could do. Or we see something in creation and beauty and we're like, he made that with his word. How powerful he is. And, and you're just getting closer and closer. You're ascribing the glory due his name. And I say that because while growing in faith is not a linear process, it's not one where it's always like better, 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 heaven. It's not like that. It's like, Better, 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 struggle, 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 better, 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 struggle, 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 better, 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 struggle, 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 real struggle, struggle, coronavirus, struggle, struggle, better, 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 better. You know, and 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 we're just kind of moving in that direction, right? It's almost like the historical stock market. Remember when everyone was freaking out back in March and April and selling all their stuff? Mmm, shouldn't have done that, right? Because what does it do? It kind of does this and and this and this and Historically, it, it just grows. And I want you to know that because the, to, to know Jesus as he is, is to love him more. Not to say you won't go through struggles of his attributes and say, how does that work? What, what, is, what does that mean? And all that stuff. But at the bottom line, to know Jesus is to love him and to love what you find which gets you into a cycle of growth. And this is how it works, right? You ascribe or remember, you grow in truth, and then you become more passionate about God. And th let's be honest, right? The things you are passionate about, you want to learn more about. And then as you learn more, you become more passionate. And then you want to learn more again. Truth, spirit, truth, spirit, and on and on until you breathe your last and see Jesus face to face. I want to close with this. It's kind of a, a bonus point. So we're going to say this is like a two and a half point sermon. It's like a Ramada, two and a half star hotel. This is a two and a half point sermon, right? David didn't just worship in spirit and in truth, but he grew as a worshiper. And I think this is an important thing for us to close on today. You see, in David's life, you can observe a growing depth of praise with some of the most powerful lessons in praise coming from the end of his life and his perspective. So here are some things that I gleaned from David's life that I'm going to share with you that I think will help you and me grow as worshipers. First of all, he was always doing it. He was always in the mode of worship. Yes, there was the actual approach to God in the assembly, but he worshiped in the fields. He worshiped in Saul's presence. He worshiped in battle. He worshiped in adversity, and he worshiped in success. He filtered all of his life through his relationship with God instead of just coming to God when things got out of hand. It was a walking faith. And the truth is, the more you do something, the better you get at it. And there isn't a person alive who is looking to increase the quality of their life by decreasing the amount of worship that they practice. So one, you gotta be consistent. 
And this, is, this is the problem that we see with people who infrequently worship with us or join us. They're like, you know, I would join you, but I'm just struggling in my faith. And I'm like, would you say like, I would go to the hospital if I felt better? It just blows my mind. It, it's like, yeah, you have to be consistent and you have to press through and you have to stay at it for it to become a habit, for it to build joy in your life. If you're waiting, you know, for just to have that, well, you know, Christmas Eve, I'll be there, whatever, whether it's online or in person or whatever and, and all that stuff and God will just set my heart on fire. No, that won't happen. It takes consistency. Second, remember what I told you before. Worship is a verb. The Bible tells us that whatever we do, we are to do it for the glory of God. Listen, there's nothing wrong with adding more of what we would traditionally call worship to our lives. So you're like, you know what? I watch on Sunday and I'm gonna be here when they open back up on Sunday in person, but I think maybe I'll go to Tuesday too. Awesome, that's great. You won't regret it. It'll be awesome. I'm a little scared about this birthday thing, but it, it's, it's, it's gonna be great. I know it is because we don't ever leave worship and be like, well, that was terrible. It's awesome. It is. But my challenge to you is not just add more of that to what you're doing, but instead find ways to take the things you are doing right now and turn them from activity into action of worship. Think about where you work. Think about how you work. Think about the people you work with and the people you work for. Think about school and about your teachers and think about your classmates. Think about bigger things when you're in the middle of little activities. It brings meaning to it. With your family, it's not just family time. It's all God's time. How can we bring God into that? How can we turn attention to him? How can we bring a little halal to the table? How can we do that? Next, for heaven's sakes, stop censoring yourself with God. Psalm 142 verses one through two says this, says, with my voice, I cry out to the Lord. With my voice, I plead for mercy to the Lord. I pour out my complaint before him. I love this. I tell my trouble before him, right? And you see this throughout David's life. All he ever did was express everything he ever felt to God. And if you go back and read David's writings, you will see him expressing depression, fear, complaint, confusion, anger, sorrow, disappointment. I mean, for heaven's sakes, Jesus quoted David on the cross. All of these from a man after God's own heart. His worship was not tidy. It was total. It put everything on the table and received all of God's grace. Last thing I want to tell you is this. Worship expectantly. Not with expectations, but expectantly. See, to worship with expectations is kind of like a quid pro quo faith. It's like, yeah, God, I'll do this. You'll do that. That's called the prosperity gospel, and it's crap. So what, what we want to do is we want to know that as we approach God, as we are engaged with God, God is going to do something. And an expectant worshiper is ready and anticipating what life on God's terms will look like with unconditional joy. There is power in praise and transformation of the heart of a person that is seeking more of God and less of self. Worship can bring so many things, my friends. It can bring freedom, healing, reconciliation, comfort, strength, confidence, generation-altering repentance, hope, and restoration. When you ascribe in your worship to the glory of God, you enter the presence of the same God 
who turned 11 petrified men into evangelists, who gave hope to a woman at the well, who turned a demon-possessed man into someone who told his whole town about Jesus, and who turned Saul into Paul. He was at work then, and that same God is at work now. One of the big stories in our world today is the increasing crackdown against the people of Hong Kong by the Chinese Communist Party. And it's a story that should get a lot more attention than it has. But I want to tell you something that has happened in Hong Kong that inspired me greatly when I read about it. You see, what happened was Hong Kong was under British control, and then I think it was 1999, I think by some treaty that was signed, they turned it back over to mainland China, but they agreed to allow it to remain something of an independent province. But over time, because you know China's not real good at respecting boundaries and relationships and things like that, um, they have intruded more and more. They've infiltrated the political machinery of Hong Kong and had brought before the people earlier this year an extradition bill. And that extradition bill basically was going to wipe out the rights of citizens of Hong Kong, that people could be extradited to mainland China for political, um, fam familial, something I heard, something they posted, whatever. I mean, it was a big deal. And so the, the bold and courageous people of Hong Kong, they protested. They took to the streets. And they had these huge rallies. And these rallies were mainly young people. And, man, I was watching them, and the way that they conducted themselves and the way they stood up to power was inspiring to me. But I didn't know this. I didn't know that there was a song that the protesters had taken up as, like, their rallying cry. And it's so unusual that this would become their cry, but the song written here in the United States for Easter in 1974, is called Sing Hallelujah to the Lord. And at almost every rally, these groups of tens and hundred thousands of protesters would sing in unison in their language, sing hallelujah to the Lord. Wherever they went, whoever confronted them, and there were observers who even noted that when the police were ready to crack down, that song diffused tensions and often allowed everybody to just kind of go back to where they were. What's interesting to me is that they scrapped the extradition bill. They gave up on it. And I was like, why is nobody talking about this? Like, this is a big deal that you have these people who protested peacefully against a government that has all the power in the world and all they had was a song called Sing Hallelujah to the Lord and they backed off. And by the way, only 10% of the people in Hong Kong are Christians. Think about that. Why? Because there is power in praise. And even when people didn't understand the truth they were chanting or singing, the words had power. And they appealed to a God who is greater than the government and a God who knows them each by name. People of God, let that be our song. Halal to the Yah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So let's raise that hallelujah and watch what God can do. Let's pray together. Lord, as we close our time together, I recognize that in this discussion about worship, there is a battle going on right now. There, there is a battle going on in the hearts of your people over what is right, over what is real, over what we can count on. And Lord, there are people who are in bondage that are being called to freedom. There are 
people who are suffering, who are being called to healing. There are people who are out of a relationship with you who are being called into a relationship with you. Lord Jesus, move in the hearts of your people. And I pray that as we raise a hallelujah to you today, Lord, that we would understand the power of those words. To know, Lord, that even in the middle of the storm, praise has power. And to know as David did, that to be a person of praise is to be a person equipped with the power of God. Lord, move in us, move through us, teach us, help us to become more like you and grow our faith and grow our praise. We ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. As we close our time out together here today, we're encouraging you to respond. Maybe God is doing something in your life and you need prayer. We have people here on campus today who can pray for you through the phone, on video, however we can pray with you. In the comment section, let us know on the feed and we'll be more than glad to do that. Let's give back to the Lord our tithes and offerings. He has been so good to us. Let us tell him that he is great, he is mighty, and he is worthy of all praise. Let's worship together. Come on, let's sing. Sing a little louder. Sing a little louder.
you are not hidden there's never been a moment you were forgotten you are not hopeless though you have been broken your innocence stolen i hear you whisper underneath your breath i hear your sos your sos i will send out an army to find you in the middle of the darkest night it's true There is no distance We cannot be covered over and over You are not defenseless I'll be a shelter I'll be your armor I hear
Every time I try to make it on mine Every time I try to stand and start to fall And all those lonely roads that I traveled on There was Jesus When the life I built came crashing to the ground When the friends I had were nowhere to be found I couldn't see it then, but I can see it now Well, there was Jesus In the way, in the searching, in the heat
Oh.